Welcome, everybody, to episode 35 of Generation Jihad. I'm Tom Jocelyn. I'm here with Bill Roggio. We are senior fellows at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And this week, we're joined by another senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Benham Talablu. Benham, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be with you guys. Benham, you do a lot of work on Iran. You've been doing a lot of work for FDD on Iran for years now. Um, you've, you closely track a, a lot of a wide range of Iranian related topics from nuclear nonproliferation, ballistic missiles, sanctions, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the RGC, which Bill and I have written about quite a bit too, obviously. Uh, you know, foreign and security uh, policy of the government, the Iranian regime, internal politics, which I always find to be fascinating because I don't really know much about it when it comes to the internal politics in Iran. And so today on this uh, episode of the podcast, we're going to take a little, we're going to take a little detour from our regular topics. We're going to talk a little bit about the stuff in your world. Benham and let you talk about what you do, what you work on, uh, some of the interesting things that are going on, because obviously it's been a busy year here in 2020 uh, in uh, when it comes to Iran, when it comes to the assassination campaign inside Iran, when it comes to the um, the changing of the administration from the Trump administration and their sort of approach uh, to, to sort of confronting Iran in various ways to what the Biden, we can expect from the Biden team to various other issues. And we're going to sort of let you kind of get into it here a little bit. But Let's get a let's do a little personal background first. So you, you're I just found this out actually before we started recording. You're a New Yorker too. You're a New York boy, right? Just like me. That's right, New York boy. Uh, raised in Midtown East, lived there my whole life until I went to college. So do you root for any of the New York teams? Uh, um, if I have to follow, it would be the Mets. The Mets. All right. Well, that. That gets you some demerit points on this podcast, unfortunately. But at least you're not well, a, for least, you, Tom. At least but not for me. At least you're not a Philly fan, like uh, a certain somebody, hey, like a second. certain somebody who is also my colleague here. I can't, yeah, I can't do that. Um, all right, so you're you're a New York guy too, um, and you've been living now in Washington for a while, right? Living down in the swamp, we've actually, we've we've fought that off, Bill and I have successfully. Uh, we are in New York and New Jersey. You uh, guys got to come on down, help with the, the the New York City colony. Yeah, not happening. Uh, any nope. event, nope. So, so nope. Um, so you've been you've been doing this now for a while too. You've been you've been you've write a lot about Iran. You you do a lot of research, a lot of granular research on Iran and what it's doing throughout the Middle East and the region. And sort of you you mentioned all the the nasty stuff on Twitter. I mean, some of that obviously is involved with comes to the debates about Iran and Iran policy, which is sort of a whole whole thing unto itself, really. Um, but let's talk. Let's try and do more about like the actual factual background. That's what you're about. You're about getting the facts right about what's going on first and foremost. And then we can talk about maybe we'll talk a little bit about policy as well. Um, so what, what would you say about this year for Iran 2020? Obviously, the year has been challenging for everybody else. But what about the Iranian regime? How would you say it's fared in 2020? So I think 2020 has been a year of uh, a defeat loop for the Islamic Republic, if you can call it that. They went from one defeat after another. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know this from looking at mainstream Western press, whether it's the New York Times or the Washington Post, or occasionally even uh, some of the granular reporting about Iranian politics uh, that you see in the Wall Street Journal. Um, but if you look at what's going on inside the country, the first layer is, of course, this broad macroeconomic contraction. The Iranian economy is getting worse because of this thing that Washington has called the U.S. maximum pressure campaign. Coupled with, as you mentioned earlier, if you want to call it a campaign or a policy or the fact that it simply happens, these assassinations, these killings, uh, these taking off of the battlefield, if you will, of key individuals uh, in Iran as well as terrorists. Uh, officials. So you had three this year alone. We got one, we got half a month left in 2020. Who knows what may happen uh, in these last few days of the Trump administration. But the year began with the killing of Iran's most important terrorist mastermind, most important military official since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Uh, that was Qasem Soleimani. He was the commander of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Quds Force. And while the Quds Force, as you know, is a branch of the IRGC, formally there's five branches, but there's other sub branches as well. He reported directly to the Supreme Leader, closely liaised with the Supreme Leader. And the Iranian government, as you know, is more about these informal uh, trend lines and these informal relationships, as are many terrorist entities. Um, so the taking off the battlefield of that individual, someone who had so much American and coalition blood on his hands, someone who really masterminded Iran's westward power projection since 9-11, since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, since the Arab Spring, capitalizing on every opportunity. You know, some people call the Iranian strategists, some people call them ideologues. You look at the career of Qasem Soleimani, he's also, he's all of that, but he's also an opportunist. And the Islamic Republic uh, has not had those opportunities in 2020 because of the loss of people like Qasem Soleimani. 
Well, let's talk about this for a second about Qasem Soleimani, because one of the themes that uh, Bill and I harp on here is that, um, you know, taking out top uh, terrorists on the Sunni side, whether it be top ISIS terrorists or top Al Qaeda guys. I mean, that's important. It matters. It creates problems for the organizations. Um, it's probably a necessary uh, necessary policy to, to keep uh, basically pursuing in order to weaken them and make sure they can't grow stronger. Um, however, it's not going to deliver the knockout blow because they have the sprawling insurgencies at this point that they can sort of refuel their leadership from. And they have been doing that contrary to what some people say. So the question always becomes, you know, these guys, you know, some of them are more important than others to be taken out. Um, how would you say the IRGC um, has fared in trying to replace Qasem Soleimani or, you know, what, what would you say that – talk about the cost benefits or a calculation on taking him out. I mean, obviously, there are many benefits to taking him out. Um, one of the things we always try and investigate is whether or not these organizations are, are able to replace them and how easily they're – how easily can they replace them? How, what would you say comes the IRGC and Soleimani? Well, I think that's a key point. And I mean, just broadly on the on those sorts of killings, I, I agree with you. It is a cost benefit. But as you get closer to drilling down on certain individuals and the organizations that they either represent or organizations that they lead, um, you know, the Islamic Republic has created a grassroots, you know, approach to its terrorism apparatus. You know, it, it goes into the Arab world. It goes into South America. It goes globally. And the most important factor for getting someone to be part of, to be an Iranian agent or to be part of Iran's terror network is not that they have to be Persian, not that they have to be Shiite, not that they have to be Muslim, but that they have to have an anti-status quo disposition. That's the first and most important thing, that you have to be anti-status quo, anti-Western. Yeah, so that's that's what you mean by anti-status quo, is it's deeply anti-American, anti-Western. It's it's sort of a – that's a motivating part of the ideology. When we talk about ideology, that's actually a motivating part of the ideology is that sort of anti-Americanism. In many ways, exactly. And it can be simpler that, that you think the situation around you is unfair because that is the first thing that lets you get preyed upon. And Qasem Soleimani, he had a lot of battlefield charisma. His legacy is known in the Iran-Iraq war. Obviously, uh, he translated that in the 1990s with his service in the IRGC. He tapped to become Quds Force chief in the late 1990s. And then as the architect of this regional security policy, he's hard to replace because he's had so many personal relationships with these militias, these entities these proxies that Iran has created or co-opted. Um, he benefited immensely starting in 2012 with the publicity about him in this town. Uh, there's uh, lots of good scholarship on him already. There's a book written about him. There's a series of monographs that AEI did from back in the day. There's a couple of Wall Street Journal articles. There's a New Yorker article. And then, of course, there's the deluge of think tank analysis. Uh, so he benefited from that. And by definition, his proxies and partners and terrorist apparatus has benefited from that. And the guy that they put in place is also someone who has a similar career trajectory, who fought in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, his name is Ismail Ghani. Uh, but rather than be, uh, despite also coming uh, from that uh, background, rather than be obsessed with Iran's West or projecting power into the Arab world. This guy has been active on Iran's Eastern Front, which in many ways is somewhat more forgotten. It's about Iran's campaigns in Afghanistan, liaising with non-state actors in these jurisdictions of weak central authority like Iran and Baluchistan, where there's been an insurgency for quite a long time. So he comes from that network and he doesn't have those personal relationships. And that's made it very hard thus far to be as effective. I mean, there's other impediments to the Iranian efficacy uh, when it comes to support for terrorism, it could be lack of money, it could be the inability of the proxy to have the right weapon, it could be the battlefield circumstances in places like Yemen, Iraq, or Syria that inhibit a certain kind of operation from being carried out. It could be the resolve of an Iranian adversary like Israel to deter whatever gains you make and erode them like Israel is doing to Iran and Syria, for instance. So there's lots of mitigating factors. But broadly, when you talk about you know killing the leader of a terrorist apparatus like Soleimani, I agree with you that it doesn't deliver a knockout blow. Uh, but I, I think terrorism in some ways, as much as I want to solve it, I'm very cognizant that it is in the current sense a management problem. Uh, that it's a question. Yeah, of no, we're, we're there. We're there too. You know, we've been having this policy debate on Al Qaeda and ISIS. You know, we don't define it as the end state is not victory against these organizations. It's sort of a managing them at this point. You know, where, but uh, you know, you can see from people who are arguing for withdrawals now across the board uh, throughout the Middle East or elsewhere that they are basically saying that these organizations are all but defeated. You know, and we think that's the wrong way to look at it. You know, basically the U.S. now has a much smaller footprint in a lot of these different theaters. 
Um, you know, and it, the, the question is whether or not you can affect a positive outcome with a smaller footprint, basically a sort of an economy of force type thing. So where do you think, where, where do you think the energy goes? Quick, what do you think? Quick, yeah, sure. Just a quick footnote on that. No, sorry. I'm talking so much already on this podcast. Uh, no, no. It's, it's That's true, what the though. podcast is for, Ben. I'm just <laughs> what the podcast is for. Yeah. I can't, I can't. I Believe me, I'd rather listen to you yeah. talk than me or Bill talk. That's for Bill and I talking but for I'm, a while. I'm here so not to listen to myself anymore, but. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, the analogy is making your adversary fight with one arm tied behind their back, right? These terrorist organizations, they have money. In the case of Iran, is the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. The Quds Force is still active. The IRGC is still active. Iran is still doing crazy stuff in Iraq, it's still proliferating weapons. But they're doing so with one arm tied behind their back. The sanctions are eroding their revenue. The, the change in personnel creates bureaucratic dynamics that hinder the efficacy of their terror operations. And if you take this approach, you know, kind of like a death by a thousand cuts to these entities, you can help drive them towards inefficacy or irrelevance. And I think, again, I'm not a terrorism scholar, but I think that's one way to deal with these entities. And that's where doing these targeted killings of people who have great amounts of American and coalition blood on their hands weighs more in the benefit than in the cost category. But we do have to appropriately red team when there's a highly public figure like Soleimani that the regime is going to be incentivized towards a highly public response, as we saw in January. Now, no, no, Benham, the, I would argue that I'm curious what you think about this. I mean, wouldn't it have been far greater impact to have killed Soleimani, say, in 2008 rather than in 2020? Soleimani has done a lot of legwork in the Middle East establishing the relationship with the Houthis, uh, the Iraqi militias. I mean, I, I think the impact of this is, will, is yet to be seen for years to come. You know, even with the, the problems inside Syria, um, establishing the militias there and the support for the Syrian regime, uh, the increased support for Hezbollah. It's, I, I would argue that he's, he's laid the groundwork for this. Um, you know, it was more important to have a charismatic leader who was willing to spread the revolution and build the relationships. And, you know, now, you know, yes, listen, I, you know, they don't want to lose a leader like him, but you can, the IRGC at Cuds Force can certainly manage relationships better now that the relationships have been established. That's one point. And the second is, is, and yes, I agree with you at death by a thousand cuts. It's, it's certainly a way to go. But I, I always have a, the feeling that once these organizations are established, once they have their hooks into countries, unless you're going to go out and root them out, um, you know, with troops on the ground, they're, they're going to remain. Hez, Lebanese Hez, Hezbollah, how long has it been established? The Iraqi militias since 2003. We're not, you know, we're now 17 years down the road there. I don't see them going anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, just just two thoughts. And I'm curious as what your, your opinion is on that. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot there on on preventative action against Soleimani much earlier. I think it's it's clear now, given his whatever date you start at, post 2005, post 2007, post 2008, whatever you want to start as, should X action have been taken earlier? You look at the career, you look at the resume, him and Iran and the IRGC have had in the region. I think, of course, the case would lean heavily on yes, this would have been an instance of preventative action against one individual to hinder, retard, impede, or root out altogether all the things in the region that Iran is known to have done since whatever date you ask, 2007, 2008. And those will all change again, based on the theater, like Yemen will be different than Iraq. But I think having the terrorist mastermind off the battlefield would make a qualitatively different kind of foreign policy challenge for Iran to have to deal with. And if it was dealt with earlier, you know, just as a small footnote, we talked about uh, D.C., living in D.C. You know, D.C. has a hard time saying if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. Just And, and a footnote and a, and a great explainer of this debate is because Soleimani is in the Quds Force. Uh, and the Quds Force is a branch of the IRGC, is how long it took to actually designate the IRGC. You know, there's a great book, I think it's called The Twilight War by David Chris. You know, some people have issues with the policy prescriptions and the framing of the book, but it's a U.S.-Iran history. Uh, I think his dad was instrumental in setting up CENTCOM back in the day. His dad was a U.S. general, um, David Christ. Uh, he also served, I believe, in the U.S. military. Um, but he talks about how there was, in 2007, the, des the desire by Washington to strike back at the Iranian mainland militarily uh, in response to these IEDs and EFPs, and a desire to even sanction the whole IRGC. And the Bush administration didn't do that. I think in October 2007, it, it worried about the reputational costs and the precedents being set of designating a branch of an Iranian government entity. After all, 
the IRGC is a formal branch of Iran's government. Um, it's part of the larger security structure there, despite engaging in terrorism. So they only designated the Quds Force in 2007. And it took literally a decade, literally a decade, same month, October, but October 2017, for the same Treasury Department Executive Order Authority to be used against the entire uh, IRGC. And then it took a year and a half after that to actually use the foreign terrorist organization, the most punitive, reputationally damaging, economically damaging uh, sanction against an an organization that we call terrorist, uh, for Washington to be able to get that bureaucratic train going to designate the IRGC in its entirety as a foreign terrorist organization. And so if you're telling me that, you know, wouldn't have been better uh, to have removed Soleimani from the battlefield earlier, I'm sure, you know, given what he's done in the region, it would have been. But also looking at us as critically as we look at the adversary and looking at how challenging and damning it was for us to be even able to do one designation in in America, and us, I'm not a part of the US government, as you know, but us as in like Americans to have this national debate. Is the IRGC a terrorist organization, yes or no? Can you imagine how rancorous and challenging that debate was or would have been in the IC uh, in all those years? And, and uh, Benham, on that point, uh, so difficult to designate the IRGC. I mean, how, how silly is this when Iran is designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. Wouldn't that mean that every other organization under the state of Iran? I mean, this is the, the the lack of logic that I see in Washington. It should be a no brainer that we should go and designate the IRGC and Quds Force and, and any other, you know, the Intelligence Bureau and any other organization. When, when they're the arms that are sponsored. responsible for carrying out the terrorism well, on behalf exactly. of a state sponsor yeah. of terrorism, right? I mean, it's sort of that's the basic exactly. logical loophole. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah, this is it, this is why Tom and I don't like to be in D.C. Uh, it, it's for reasons like this. It makes my head explode. So I'll just leave it at that. I mean, obviously, comment or not on that, but I just wanted to point that. Well, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, principally, what you're what you're saying makes sense. I just think bureaucratically, legally, there's always been these these counter arguments in D.C., which I think it's important to engage with. But that doesn't diminish or destroy what you just said about when these are the entities already working for this sanctioned uh, government called the Islamic Republic of Iran. It has that moniker "World's Foremost State Sponsor of Terrorism" given to it by the State Department, and it's acted ever since it was founded to live up and to. By that the way, given that, that moniker, even during the Obama years, when the Obama administration was seeking detente with the Iranian regime to a certain extent, it was still recognized even then on the State Department as the premier world sponsor of terrorism. You can go back to the reports and sort of the, I think there was some language in one of the State Department's country reports on terrorism about the remarkable resurgence in state sponsored terrorism or something along those lines when it coming from Iran. So this isn't a, this isn't a partisan thing. This isn't a policy oriented thing. This is just sort of a fact thing, which is where Bill and I come from and get a little frustrated because the logic that's applied to these facts often doesn't make any sense. And I'm sure there were bureaucratic, believe me, I'm sure there are all sorts of bureaucratic, uh, you know, <laughs> Fighting yeah. on, on this type of thing, we we know about that when it comes to the Connie network, when uh you know when, when it, in their role with the Taliban, the Taliban, the Taliban itself. itself. I mean, there's all sorts of tortuous logical loopholes here that that this stuff is approached through, uh you know, so that that makes sense. But so all right, so now you got the IRGC, so Customs of is taken out. Uh, you get some other sort of key figures within the IRGC. Um, sort of architecture have, have been taken out. What what about inside Iran itself, right? Obviously, Soleimani is killed in in Iraq um, alongside uh, Mohandas, who's one of uh, Bill's favorite characters in all this. Bill was writing about him, writing about him very early on as a you know Iranian you know proxy. Um, but now let's go to the assassination campaign inside Iran itself, and what can you tell us about that? And this, particularly, the, I know you've written about this. Um, nuclear scientist who was just killed, assassinated, and, and so you know a lot about him, and maybe you can give our audience some details on him and why he was significant to the regime and that sort of thing. Sure. And just in between those months, because that uh, that killing of Soleimani was in January, and this killing uh, of this foremost Iranian military nuclear scientist uh, known as Dr. Mohsen Fakhrizadeh Mahabadi, or just Fakhrizadeh, sometimes he's referred to, uh, was in the end of November. In between that time is, again, more data, more evidence for that defeat loop, how the Islamic Republic kept doing things that kept accentuating those cuts that the U.S. max pressure campaign had been driving into it. So we have this broad top layer 
macroeconomic contraction seen in declining oil sales, seen in the sanctions effectiveness, seen in the GDP uh, going down, seen in the inflation, seen in the devaluation of the Iranian currency, seen in all these macroeconomic measures that you can prove these sanctions are having this effect. Then, of course, we have the killing of Soleimani. Then, of course, you have uh, the botched response to the accidental downing of the Ukrainian airliner just days after the killing of Soleimani. And I remember doing a lot of media after the killing of Soleimani, talking to press, talking to different reporters doing TV shows, radio, televised debates, whatnot. And people would cite that rally in Iran, like, oh, look, it's a rally around the flag effect. And then just days later, they literally just, just days later, probably you can count them on one hand, not even a double digit figure. Days later, with this downing of the Ukrainian airliner, you saw protests in Iran against the regime. So if the most foremost terrorist management mind of this regime, who the regime was trying to cast as a martyr, Right during his life, Soleimani had the epithet "the living martyr," if I'm not mistaken, and then he actually became one <laughs> after uh, after that strike in January. And not just soon enough from Bill's point of view, but yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just days later, that whole rally effect was gone. This this explodes the thesis that that any kind of rally, which is probable to see in any society once there's an attack on the homeland or an attack on an entity affiliated with quote unquote defending the homeland, this is not gonna be a sticky rally. The, the talking point in Washington was that the regime would use this forever. The regime couldn't even use this for longer than a week because of its own actions. So when it finally admitted to the downing of Ukraine airliner, there was more protests in response to that. Then a month later in February, 2020, there was parliamentary elections. Uh, it had the low, lowest turnout in the recorded history of the Islamic Republic for parliamentary elections, another slap in the face to the regime. We know that the regime since Khomeini, since the founding father of the Islamic Republic was in power, they tried to use elections, even highly localized ones, to signal their legitimacy. So this was a huge slap in the face of legitimacy. It came on the tail end of massive protests in November 2019, the most violently repressed protests in the history of the Islamic Republic, with over 1,500 people killed in those protests, and those protests continuing into 2020. Then once you pass the Bosch parliament election results, you have the Bosch response to the COVID crisis really escalating throughout Iran, the regime pushing all sorts of odd conspiracy theories about how to deal with this global pandemic, not doing the proper lockdowns in time. And listen, I totally get that every country in some weird way has botched it, but the regime was amazing about retaining its ties to China, about not doing the lockdown in time, and about pushing conspiracy theory theories at the highest of levels. Well, we're, I want to come COVID back to that in one second about the China stuff, because that's part of the, the this is, you know, when they look at the board internationally, they realize China is somebody who's a, a very important piece to keep on their side, which is part of the reason why they don't want to offend the Chinese regime, the, the Chinese Communist Party too much. We'll come back to that, but keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt exactly. No, no, yeah. ex exactly. And, there, and then there's been more crises after that. That. But if, for instance, there was this Iranian ship, if I'm not mistaken, in the summer of 2020, the, this vessel called the Konarak, you know, you can call it a mini crisis, the Konarak crisis, because it was a friendly fire incident. You know, there was a, a naval drill and they fired on their own ship. And I think they killed 19 of their own sailors. And this this defeat loop, this cycle of incapability, of tough rhetoric, of hyperbole, of boisterousness actually masks a weaker regime from within. A weaker regime doesn't mean it's not lethal, but it simply means that it may not be as capable as we lay it out. Sometimes as Iran hawks were all kind of slandered as making them look 10 feet tall. I think to be really accurate about the Iranian threat, it's not that they're two feet tall and, you know, we have to just give them a little bit of money and we're good. And it's not that they're 10 feet tall and, oh my God, we have to hide. And for some reason, a country with the GDP, you know, I'm going to be pejorative here with respect to uh, the GDP is, you know, much less than some uh, underdeveloped uh, countries that don't even export oil. It's not that. It's really, you know, out of a th out of a scale of 10, it's like a, you know, a six, but it's growing. And that delta in where this regime grows and how it's able to be opportunistic about that growth and how it has low cost, high impact threat factors for us and our partners and our interests and our adversaries against the region is what makes this regime, which is otherwise rather weak, particularly conventionally, last for so long and use its ideology so for so long in this way. So they've had lots of these crises, lots of these defeat loops in 2020, and the killing of that scientist, as well as, of course, the killing of an Al-Qaeda operative, Al-Masri, someone who's uh, 
history, I, I don't know anywhere as much as you guys, but gets to this larger point, which you guys have struggled to make publicly and for some reason is still not in the mainstream, despite you guys citing evidence from U.S. government sources from even in the Obama era about the Iran-Al-Qaeda connection. And that connection actually gets us to a point I was talking about earlier, which is, you know, Iran doesn't need you to be a Shia. Iran needs you to simply disbelieve or dislike the global status quo. And if you're a state sponsor of terrorism like the regime is, you can instrumentally support, withdraw support, aid, fund, train, equip a whole slew of different actors because ultimately they're shooting at the same guys you want to shoot at. And there's that Napoleon quote, which was popularized a lot in D.C. because people we're framing it as uh, something against the Trump campaign, but it's when your enemy's making a mistake, don't interrupt them. Uh, and so in many ways, as the U.S., and you guys can attest to this given everything you worked on and written, as the U.S. hyper-focused on the Sunni side of violent extremism and terrorism, it ignored this Shiite side. That kind of permitted this nexus between the two by the Iran AQ connection to grow and to grow even on Iranian territory. Yeah, and, by, and by the way, you know, if we actually, you know, one of the things we sort of have to have this in our, our airing of grievances episode, Bill, which we still have to do later this year. But, you know, we would argue even that even as the Washington uh, rhetorically was hyper focused on the Sunni jihadi side, they were major fissures within Washington's understanding of the whole thing. And those fissures have come home to roost now and played out in Afghanistan and elsewhere where you can see that people don't really understand this stuff. So, yeah, nominally, there was a lot more of a hyper focus on the Sunni jihad side of things. Um, but um, there are a lot of problems. Yeah, even that, even then, there wasn't. I mean, there's there's still stuff that it's not understood to this day, which should be pretty basic, you know. I mean, my my quip, my my running joke is, you know, if there are 17 U.S. intelligence agencies at one point in time, I, I hear it's gotten better, but at one point in time, there are 22 different definitions of Al Qaeda, you know. So, uh, you know, it, you know, yeah, I mean, th- th- there's a lot of common disagreement on this stuff because a lot of the basic facts aren't really understood, you know. So you add in the Iranian side where. You know, the entire conversation, obviously, about Iran takes place post-2003, the Iraq invasion, which was enormously controversial here in the U.S. And, of course, that's that colors everything, obviously, in how you talk about this stuff. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why I think you're very smart to stay off Twitter, by the way. Uh, but, um, you know, but yeah, so so you've laid out a compelling case now about what's going on inside Iran and, and outside Iran. But let's talk a little bit about this nuclear scientist again. Let's drill down on him a little bit. Let's give me give me some biography. We, we're nerds, Ben. That's what we do here. We're nerds. We like biographies. We like like firm details on who these guys are. Give us some, give us some dirt on this guy. Who, who was he, you know, and, and give us some of his background and why, you know, why he was important to the regime. So while there may be a lot of other officials in Iran who, if Iran does fully get a nuclear weapon one day, would want to lay credit to, I'm the father of the Iranian atom bomb, even people from the previous regime in Iran, from the monarchical regime, may want to lay claim to that. This guy actually can lay claim to a lot of it. Again, uh, Fakhri uh has kind of been present, uh, to borrow that, that phrase, present at creation uh, about, the, about the Iranian uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, he joined the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps basically right after its founding. He partook in a lot of key battles during the Iran-Iraq war, key battles that helped form these networks, intelligence, security, political networks, that when these veterans left the battlefield, entered politics, entered government, and even entered research centers and technical institutes like this guy Fafrizadeh did, they brought those networks, they brought that knowledge with them institutionally, politically, and personally. Uh, in, it's reported that in 1983, he worked for the newly formed Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps nuclear units. I had only recently heard about this a nuclear research unit. It turns out that when he did this, when he did his, he did his BA, then he took a little time off, then he did his master's in nuclear physics, then he took quite a bit of time off working in the now disbanded IRGC ministry, working closely with a guy and then later studying with a guy who actually survived an assassination attempt. He's the former director of Iran's atomic energy organization. He's sanctioned. His name is Feridun Abbasi Davani. And uh, that guy recently did an interview uh, on TV after the killing of Fatwi Sadeh saying, I knew him for about 30, 33 years, and just laid into his biography, gave a lot of detail, said he was working at this entity, the sanctioned entity, SPND, which really kept Iran's nuclear weapons options open for a while. Obviously, he didn't say weapons, but he said, high-level defense research, this kind of thing. Uh, and in many ways, uh, Fakhri Zadeh has been working in a series of sanctioned entities, you know, the Physics Research Center, Malik Ashtar University, a bunch of entities where you look them up in Treasury and State Department listings, 
uh, are really the who's who of the weapons drive of Iran. And the same, of course, with that entity, SPND. That's the Persian language acronym for this entity. It works for it works under the Iranian Ministry of Defense, which is also sanctioned. And there hadn't been a lot about this guy. And we did a dig into his bio and his history and why he matters. Um, but he, he basically has been there every step of the way when it comes to keeping the door open, formally or informally, for the Iranian nuclear weapons drive. And that should tell you one thing. When the JCPOA was enforced and we think we're actually alleviating threats, the Iranian government is simply using that time to reshuffle, remanage, and focus in an unstructured fashion how to keep a nuclear weapons option open. So for those who in D.C. who looked to the deal, who look to all of these things as a way of dealing with the preponderant Iranian threat and using that argument to say, well, we're addressing this threat. So everyone who's talking about terrorism, everyone who's talking about missiles, everyone who's talking about cyber, everyone who's talking about uh, human rights, shut up because we're dealing with the most important threat, nuclear. It proves that not only were they wrong to say shut up because all those threats grew, they didn't even properly address the nuclear threats. and in many ways, Fakhrizad was cognizant of that, continued to build his career off of that, brought a lot of research and technical institutes into this main, this increasingly mainstream effort to keep that nuclear option open, the weapons option open uh, for the regime, helping split it into public and private, uh, or covert and overt, I should say, uh, and nuclear uh, drives for the regime, helping probably come up with rationales. And it's even interesting, uh, the current atomic energy uh, agency uh, uh, director of Iran, uh, another um, a PhD holder, this time one from, I think, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, uh, Dr. Ali Akbar Salahi talked about Fakhrizadeh's legacy. And he talked about his dissertation, Fakhrizadeh's dissertation, um, which was in nuclear defense or kind of defending the homeland from nuclear attack, something that one entity Fakhrizadeh worked for, the Physics Research Center, established only one year after the end of the Iran-Iraq war, was tasked with doing, defending the homeland from nuclear attack. So Fakhrizad has been present at a lot of these different levels, military, security, research, academic, but a real symbol of the regime's drive for this weapons capability, a capability which is consistent with its ideology, and perhaps most importantly, consistent with that eight-year experience of that war that Fakhrizad and basically everyone else who is important in Iran today partook in, and that's the Iran-Iraq war. And as much as there's a focus in D.C. on the hostage crisis, because that divorced America from the Iranian friendship that they had prior to the revolution or the revolution itself, because it brought people like Khomeini in power and got rid of the Shah, I say no. The most important Iranian political development in the 20th century is the Iran-Iraq war. That war created the generation of leaders that we have today. That is the war that got the regime to resurrect the late Shah's nuclear program. That's the war that helped uh, get the regime interested in ballistic missiles, travel around places like Syria, Libya, North Korea, uh, get a ballistic missile arsenal that is now the, the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the entire Middle East. That is really the and during the time that he created connections with the Shia in Iraq and the Shia in Lebanon to create these proxies that we're all dealing with today. It's the birth period for every manifestation of threat that we face from the Islamic Republic. And it's no surprise that Fakhrizad was one face of that threat. So we're here with our colleague, Benham Talabalu, a senior fellow at the Foundation of Defense and Democracies. As uh, you, you guys or our listeners know, Bill and I are also senior fellows. Bill, you got a question? You want to follow up with Benham on that? Yeah, Benham, uh, the Iran-Iraq war, that ended in, what, 1998, is that correct? Or 88, right? Right, so 32 years ago, right? So we're talking literally a generation uh, has passed, right? So we're, we're this is one of the um, issues that uh, Tom and I constantly grapple with when we talk about targeting, right? The, you know, there's, there's 32 years for his successor to be educated and trained. And, and, and yes, it's important that we take out individuals such as him and Soleimani, right? In this case, we didn't take but, him out being the U.S., but well, actually the Israelis, Israelis did. The, the, Israelis did. Yeah, right. the Israelis, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, what What do we know about those behind them? Are they just as ideologically committed? Are they um, as talented? Um, is this, you know, I mean, yes, like, you know, I'm, oh, it's, oh, to me, it's always important to take these guys out. I argue we don't take them out soon enough and we don't consider 
who's on the bench waiting to replace. From the Israel, let me ask it a little bit differently. From the Israelis' perspective, they obviously committed assets or you know operatives to take take this guy out. They also, at the U, the behest of the American government, took out Abu Muhammad al Mazari on August seventh. We had a previous podcast on that. How easy is it to replace this guy from the Iranian regime's perspective? That's basically. If you're an Israeli policymaker looking at this, some Israelis have said that they think it's a big deal, it's a big setback for the program, uh, you know, and that he's he's not going to be easily replaced. What's your opinion on that? Well, this is where I may differ a little bit when it comes to again the killing of terrorists versus the killing of nuclear scientists. I mean, in the in the terrorist sense, Qasem Soleimani was more than just a terrorist, right? He was a political entity, myth, cultural hero, everything. You know, he he, sure. he was all over a bunch of American front page magazines as the, the the leading the fight against ISIS. He became so much more than just a terrorist. Um, so there, there was a lot there that comes with, if you take someone like that off the battlefield, you also puncture that myth of Iranian invincibility, of the Islamic Republic's military in, invincibility. So there was a lot of damage done there. Um, but terrorist organizations, as you guys know, there is people that you can help train. And, and while uh, Esmail Ghani, Qasem Soleimani's replacement, certainly does not have the charisma, certainly does not have the networks, uh, over time, he could develop some of those networks. And over time, especially if the U.S. begins to retreat from the region, uh, those proxies and partners that may have had an intense incentive to hedge away from Iran, they're going to have to double down on Iran. And Iran will be, and they will be more beholden on Iran. And that can give someone like Ghani more time to fill the shoes, perhaps never completely, but increasingly, of someone like Qasem Soleimani. The science domain is very different because you can't bomb some knowledge out of someone's head. You can't take a textbook necessarily out of the classroom and hope no one in the country knows what's going on. And that's where uh, it, you kind of get at this, uh, this nexus, you know, the nuclear program, the missile program, the military program of Iran, both pre-revolution and post-revolution. And really, this applies to every country which, which has these two, even the U.S. and the former Soviet Union. They're driven by two factors, status and security. And in many ways, because the regime has prioritized it for both reasons, status and security, I'm sure there's a cadre of people. Uh, relatively well-trained, relatively well-acquainted uh, enough to begin to fill this thing. And it raises the question of how effective is sabotage, cyber, and even targeted killings in a larger counter-proliferation campaign? Uh, I think, broadly speaking, and again, I'm not a scholar of terrorism, uh, that killings, those, you know, taking the terrorist leader off of a battlefield in, in a certain war or in a certain country they're operating in may be more effective than the killing of a nuclear scientist. I think it certainly handicaps the program and certainly it punctures that mythology. You know, the regime has cultivated the mythology of the nuclear program and the missile program are designed, they're the, they're the, the crown jewel of the regime. They're designed to keep everyone safe. But in reality, if the programs are so punctured, given the campaign of sabotage we saw this summer against, I don't know how many entities, 19 entities, 20 entities, and, and in particular, a centrifuge workshop uh, ex uh, blown up, exploded, uh, it impedes their operations. Again, it's like making them fight with one arm tied behind their back. But if you're going to focus on uh, assassinations or these kind of targeted killings, uh, I think the terrorism one, in my view, may have a greater qualitative impact on the program. Um, because when it comes to counterproliferation, there may be other tools less costly, more effective, or less costly, equally as effective, or less costly, questionably as effective. And those are, again, sanctions, cyber sabotage, and other kinds of sabotage, introducing faulty parts into a supply chain. There was a New York Times article that said we did that with long-range ballistic missile uh, uh, components for Iran's illicit procurement drive, in particularly, assumedly, places like East Asia, where the regime likes to go shopping. Um, and given that it's happened so many times before, you know, it's not the first killing of an Iranian nuclear scientist. Um, uh, the regime has already this default language about being a nuclear martyr ready to go. Uh, it can sanctify, quote unquote, the career path of these individuals. And looking at, um, you know, the output or the growth of Iran's nuclear capability, unfortunately, it, ha it has continued. It's continued despite sanctions. It's continued despite sabotage. It's continued despite killings. Now, that doesn't mean these tools may not be more or less valid, but they need to be compared with each other in terms of the cost that it could get the regime to want to escalate or retaliate. So long story short, it does handicap the regime, 
perhaps less so than some other counter proliferation tools. But in terms of puncturing that larger mythology, that is part of the larger psychological warfare campaign against the regime. And if you're an Iranian living inside the country, you're seeing your country squeezed by horrible uh, economic mismanagement for four, uh, four, four decades, plus these tough sanctions now. And the place where the money is all flowing is drastically insecure. I mean, it, it is able to be punctured by tons of intelligence operatives. You look at the theft of the nuclear archive. You know, that was right out from under the regime's nose. This gets back to that point I was talking about, about making sure we right-size the Iranian threat in the way that doesn't just give into hawkish or dovish arguments, but gives into the correct arguments about what kind of threat this is, wherein lies the capability, and what can the world do to impede and then destroy this capability. We, have to have we, could, t- we could tell you're from New York because you're a fast talker like me. So you just sorry, covered sorry. about, no, you just, that's great. I mean, I, that's one of the complaints I gave on the podcast about my talking, and I, I don't really care. People tell me I've talked too fast, you know, but you just cover, you just were zipping right through about 10 different things that people are going to ask I, you I about. Got, I got so much to say. I'm so excited. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's great. No, it's great, but it's just, it's, uh, it's just something we share in common. And I think if it was just, Bill, you got to break us up here because if it's just me and Ben I'm going back and forth nobody's going to listen to this we're too fast <laughs> talking New Yorkers going at it so no I just wanted to just I'll add to that Ben it just doesn't help when we train nuclear scientists at MIT and places like that that certainly is uh, shooting ourselves in the foot well you had some other questions though Bill about the Houthis and everything and the upcoming designation yeah. Or yeah. there's de- there's a d- dispute or you know a, a sort of an ongoing policy argument about whether or not to do that yeah, Ben. Uh, so yeah, it, it's been disclosed that there's a consideration the Trump administration will designate the Houthis, which of course are uh, rebels, Shia rebels in Yemen. They control half, uh, more than half the country, including the capital of Sanaa. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you do you think it's a good idea, a bad idea, to to do this designation? And and how do you view the Houthis in the Iranian? proxy sphere? Are they a direct proxy? Have they been co-opted? Um, I'd love to hear your opinion on, on these topics. Um, I, well, again, there's, there's a lot there, but I, I think there's some alliteration. Uh, and I think my New Yorkerness may get in the way, so I'm definitely going to slow down. Uh, but that alliteration is CCC, Create Co-Opt Control. Uh, the regime takes a different approach to a different kind of people in a different type of battlefield based on the different threat perceptions that it has. Sometimes we uniformly in DC uh, throw around the term proxy, uh, you know, but that may not be the best term given the relationship of the regime to this entity. Uh, Like we talked about groups that Iran creates, Badr uh, in Iraq, Lebanese Hezbollah in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, for instance. And the more these groups engage in transnational operations, the less rooted they become in the country that they were born. So by Lebanese Hezbollah allegedly being in Yemen, uh, allegedly helping Iran train Iraqi Shias inside Iran, as well as inside Iraq, as well as fighting in Syria, they become a lot less Lebanese. You know, people have made that point before. Um, So it helps disabuse you of that title and and it increases in the stigmatization of those groups and then can get people more behind a pressure campaign against those groups. Um, Something like the Houthis in Yemen, you know, the Houthis have been of people uh, far before the Islamic Republic was ever a speck in the eye of, of uh, the, the members of the Iranian clergy. So they practice a different branch of Shiite Islam, but increasingly, given the war in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, they have become what I like to call a trusted partner uh, of the regime. So they're a movement, an insurgency uh, that the regime has co-opted. And the longer this co-optation goes on, the greater the potential for them to become a full-blown proxy. The million-dollar question is, at what point do they become a full-blown proxy? And I have to admit, at this one, I'm not fully sure. In some ways, there is more distance between the regime, ideologically and politically, with the Houthis than than its Iraqi patrons, for instance, or, or its Iraqi proxies, for instance. But at the same time, when you look at the weaponry that the regime has given the Houthis, the proliferation of uh, formerly American, then Iranian reverse engineered surface to air missiles. You know, I wrote a piece in Long War Journal a little while ago uh, called, you know, uh, an Iranian SAM in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, that was actually based off of a, of a, a, a surface to air missile, I think, that we sold the Shah, that the Iranians reverse engineered and then ultimately proliferated. And then when you look at 
the short range ballistic missile capabilities. And short range is actually ironically under a thousand kilometers. You know, the, the Iraqi proxies only allegedly got this stuff in 2018 and when Iran started parking SRBMs, according to press reports in Western Iraq. But the Houthis, you know, they were striking deep into Saudi territory with these missiles in 2017. So in some ways, the Houthis have gotten qualitatively a lot of stuff, perhaps even land attack cruise missile capabilities. Um, you could justify that by saying that's where the most active war zone is, or that's where Iran has the least kind of presence. So if it's going to rely on a group that's already an insurgency, already willing to fight and die, all you need to do is arm them and lay back. They also know how to fight. And after all, this is Yemen. The country was divided before. Different shifting, uh, different you know, shape shifting between the coalitions in that country, pro-Saudi, anti-Saudi. That's part of the Houthi legacy. Um, so they may not be yet a full-blown proxy. But then there is, of course, a Houthi ambassador to Iran. There is an Iranian ambassador, Houthis, who was just designated today uh, by the U.S. Treasury Department. That may be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to future designations. I think this approach is the right approach. Generally, uh, when it comes to pro-Iran militias and proxies in Iraq and Syria, I don't like this approach. I don't like first the leader and then wait and see what happens and then the and then the rest of the group. I think you should be blanketly going after these groups. Well, they play that game guys. on the Sunni jihad side too, Benham, as well. We've, we've yeah. seen that over and over again when it comes to the Sunni jihadist organizations, the al-Qaeda affiliated groups in particular. That, that happens over and over again. Same deal. So maybe it's bureaucratic. Maybe it's the way Treasury or the law enforcement apparatuses deal with uh, the security apparatus in the U.S. And they say, OK, we're going to take a graduated approach. Um, in Yemen, I think that may bear fruit because I don't know. Both sides of the aisles want this conflict to be done. And then ultimately, the longer the conflict lingers, the closer the proxies, the the the, the Houthis will become to being a proxy. The, the faster it ends, well, the quicker you have a potential off ramp. Um, and that may be the one, that plus humanitarian concerns may be the one thing holding a lot of people back when it comes to a full blown designation. But then you have to weigh that with, well, they've gotten the most qualitatively sophisticated weaponry. There's a significant goods force presence there. They're dating and bleeding major U.S. Ad, uh, allies in the region, Saudi and the UAE formally with the coalition. It's a huge reputational stain. It's a low cost, high impact Iranian campaign there. Uh, it's threatening shipping the Red Sea, uh, the Bab el Mandeb. You know, if, if Iran fully secures this ship, this uh, waterway, uh, then they have the Strait of Hormuz and the, the Bab el Mandeb. That's a significant impediment in the world's energy supply. And I think all should be done to prevent this insurgency from winning, particularly when there is a UN process in place that is largely ignored. Um, and every time the Houthis have had an opportunity, to be brutally honest, and Bill and I were talking about this before, uh, the Iranians have either armed them or encouraged them to attack. I remember, I think, when MBS was in New York or when he was traveling around America, there was rocket attacks on Saudi cities. And I think that's intentional. That was an intentional image that Houthi patrons wanted to project uh, about the way the war is going. And the longer it lingers, um, the greater the damage. So I'm it also, get, it also gets into a whole complicated thing here with the Saudis, of course, and their bombing campaign and MBS. And, you know, B Bill and I have always very clear on this podcast, we don't carry water for any of these guys, uh, you know, on any of this stuff. It's all, you know, talking through the different policy sort of ramifications of what's going on, you know, but it, it is interesting. I mean, you can see a lot of people who are hyperactive in this sphere. They they only highlight the Saudi role, which there's plenty to criticize. Don't get me wrong. Of course, there is. Um, and then they don't talk about the Iran role or the Iranian role about in, in sort of keeping Keeping this conflict going and fueling it and fueling the insurgency, which is ultimately what the source of instability is. Um, it's what overthrew the it's what overthrew the Hadi regime in, in in Yemen. It's what is you know basically made this you know or you know yeah Saleh withdrew in with the Houthis in order to try and reclaim power. Of course, you know, and that goes back to his own roots. And then of course the, you you talk about the UN process. Part of the problem there is they haven't been able to get a, a UN backed government that can actually. You know, whole power. So this is part. This is, this is the big problem here in this whole conflict. I mean, it's why it's still going on. Um, you know, but that none of that's to excuse the Saudis on any of this stuff. We've we're very clear on all that. It's just the case. It's just the case that you have two. You know, a nasty war raging here in Yemen that the Iranians have been able to exploit for their own purposes. Yeah, and and if I may uh, make a point here, I mean, I, I I kind of balk at calling the Houthis an insurgency at this point. They control. A significant portion of Yemeni territory. They control the capital. They act more like a state than the the Hadi government does, which they is have ambassadors confined. now. Yeah, yeah, Iran yeah. ambassadors to them. They're ambassadors to Iran. Yeah, right, right. And and I think this is a reason why you know you you have the plausible deniability aspect of this now, where the Iranians can get away. 
with shipping weapons and saying, hey, the Houthis control, you know, the, the functionaries of the, the, the Yemeni military and these weapons, these missiles they're launching, um, they're, gover- you know, missiles inherited from the Yemeni military. So I, th- I think that you get this, you know, again, this plausible deniability aspect where the Iranians can just basically say, no, no, we're not supporting it. This is this is the government of of Yemen that we recognize that's fighting. And sure, we may be spying some, you know, we have an ambassador and whatnot, but we're not the ones behind it. And and I think that's why a, uh, a designation uh, of, of the Houthis, if, you, if you're going to go forward, you know, at this point, I, there, there just seems to have been, and I think we talked this uh, with uh, Edward Fitton Brown, Tom, on a previous episode, right? There was a hope that there was going to be some negotiations that they were being held in good faith, and ultimately they weren't. The Houthis were, have um, really, you know, they've, they've just sought to take control of the country. I don't, I don't see that changing. So, and, and why would you? They, they seem to be winning at this stage. They, they have but, the upper You know, Ben Amat, when you were talking about the Sunni jihad model and the sort of the analysis that Washington did, Yemen's a great example of the failures of that, actually, uh, because at one point- It used we to be were, called the Yemen model. I was this, just going for that. Yeah. The, the Yemen model of, main, of, of holding back AQAP. Now, AQAP, we're not going to have time to get into that, but of course, the other side of this coin is the- the Sunni Jihad led by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which, you know, has all sorts it's an interesting organization. It's sort of there's an ebb and flow of the jihad. They've sort of been beaten back at times. They've held territory at other times. You know, it's really not clear what the status of that organization is overall right now. They, they obviously have a lot more chips to play than people probably give them credit for, but by the same token, there's no doubt they've taken their lumps. Um you know, but it, you know the bottom line is that the Yemen model was supposed to be the successful model for tapping down on all this, and you can we just very in a very cursory way have given all sorts of reasons why it hasn't. You know, well, you guys again, you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but it seems like the the shoe is on the other foot now with what's going on in Yemen, where there may be a hyper focus or a hyper interest on the Houthis, which could still be you know the Shiite side of the street. But something I've always wondered is just given how geographically diverse Yemen is. Again, I'm not a Yemen expert, but just knowing what we know about who occupies what part of land, where the insurgency comes from, or where the Houthis come from, uh, what is the Southern Secessionist movement, where has the UAE been more operationally effective, where has you know the Saudis been more operationally effective? Oh, this is a whole other episode. We've been doing research on this for a while. I've been trying to tease all this out, you know, in terms of what this all means for AQAP, and it's very complicated. You yeah, know? have there's, they been able there's, to... There's a lot we I'm don't know. The, the bottom line is there's a lot we don't thrive? know. Have they been able to thrive? You know, when well, the they haven't been able to thrive. They haven't been able to thrive, but AQAP is twice as seized uh, uh, significant portions of Southern Yemen. And after the Arab-led coalition, UAE and Saudis uh, sort of went in, they melted away from their forces. They they controlled Makala, the port city. They controlled other key territory. And basically, AQAP melted away. Now, it's very, very difficult. This is the truth of the matter is, and we'll give you the honest assessment here on this podcast. Nobody can really tell you, you know, how strong this organization is in Yemen at this point, right? Because it's very difficult to assess. And most of the variables we can't actually directly witness. Um, and the sourcing is spotty. Um, so... The truth of the matter is that they've suffered a lot of senior leadership losses or, or a number, I shouldn't say a lot, a, a series of senior leadership losses. That's true, including Qasem al Ramey earlier this year in January got taken out. He was an Al-Qaeda veteran who was probably part of the Al-Qaeda senior management team. Um, they've, they've taken out other guys have been taken out as well. Um, they're not controlling – Overtly controlling territory at this point, um, and then but then you get into all these contested areas in terms of assessing AQAP strength that are very difficult to assess, and we're not going to resolve them here today. So I'm going to punt, and we're not going to try and pretend to resolve them here today. But the but the point is, is that just as you know, you're dealing with this analysis on the Iranian side and the relationship with the Houthis and all these different variables you have to assess. It gets very complicated going on the Sunni side as well. You know, it just becomes a total mess. It's um, just the idea popped into my head. You know, again, definitely not an AQ watcher or expert, but as even the UN makes allegations or, or claims about the highly plausible paths for Iran to ship missile parts, missiles I've had the privilege of seeing now twice going to, you know, Joint Base Anacostia Bolding. I was like, wow, is this as close am I ever going to get to Iran? Like <laughs> looking at these weapons that they would chop up and then kind of weld back together on the battlefield. The UN says that, you know, it's plausible they could have been shipped somewhere to Oman and then driven across Oman into Eastern Yemen, and then through from there to like different routes or different pieces of territory that Houthis control. And the whole time, you know, the UN is talking about that, my mind is going, is AQ giving them laissez passe? Is AQ turning a blind eye? Are they are they bribing AQ? Like, does AQ want any of this for themselves? Like, I it just it raises more questions than answers. 
Yeah. And again, I'm going to punt. We're not going to answer those today. <laughs> so, cause it, there's just, it, it, this is an enormously complicated thing. I mean, I've, I've been reading, there's a lot of people who do a lot of work on Yemen and I, I read a lot of coverage and it, I don't think anybody has any good answers on this stuff to try and figure out. I mean, the thing is you don't want to overestimate Al Qaeda's power or abilities, but you don't want to underestimate it either. And in our field, when it comes to this stuff, the the paradigm is always what I call the disconnect the dots paradigm always seems to take root. Um, and you're talking about Houthis in Iran, you know, early on, I testified before the Senate uh, a couple of years back, and I just highlighted some of the evidence available on the Houthis in Iran. It was obvious that the Iranians were supplying weapons at that point in time, but there was a whole effort to play disconnect the dots on that. And they got into this, well, they're not Hezbollah, they're not an Iranian proxy like Hezbollah. Well, true, but that doesn't mean that they can't have a relationship and the Iranians can't sponsor or back them, right? I mean, you don't it doesn't it doesn't have to be Hezbollah. Yeah. Right. The Iranians build trust. You know, they, they they look to a group, they say, What can you do with an AK? What can you do with an RPG? What can you do with a SAM? What can you do with an air to air munition? What you know, they'll they'll give you more when you prove you can do more. There this is again the, the root of this is the opportunism. This is low cost, high impact. And then Zarif can, you know, Iran's foreign minister Zarif can go around the world saying, you know, they want a peaceful end to the war in Yemen. They, you know, they, they, he'll capitalize on like the hits Saudi reputation has taken over the war in Yemen, uh, while his country is fueling the insurgency, if not complete takeover, uh, of of this uh, uh, of this issue. And then when you have and lobbing North missiles China, into Saudi Arabia, which I mean, exactly. again, and that's not to defend the Saudi regime, but I mean, and their behavior in Yemen, the bombing campaign in Yemen. But I mean, look, the instigator here is is Iran and their support for the Houthis and what they're trying to do and, and have been doing in Yemen. Exactly. And then and then when you have a part of DC here, the citing uh, finally coming around to the fact that Iran could be arming, training, equipping, supporting the Houthis, that factoid is used against the max pressure campaign, which is to say, well, you see the sanctions aren't working because Iran is able to export these weapons or that the, the war in Yemen continues. Well, yeah, these are wars Iran partakes in because these are weapons of the weak proliferating AK-47s and even up to SRBMs. These are weapons of the weak. This is how the Islamic Republic has been able to be alive for so long and be such an anti-status quo revolutionary actor because it always outsources the fighting. And now the, the, the traumatic thing, the challenging thing, you know, the return to state power competition, the return to jurisdictions of strong central authority. You know, you guys have a career in looking at the jurisdictions of weak central authority. You know, I, my career has been looking at the strong central authority. And maybe there is a, a connecting the dots there that you guys have spoken about as well. You know, not just Pakistan, Afghanistan, not just Afghanistan, but Pakistan, who could be supporting it, like Bill is always talking about, or, you know, the militias and their patron, uh, rather than just looking at these ungoverned spaces, look at who, who is sending people into ungoverned spaces. And that's something that Iran excels in so well. But the reason this era is so different is that Iran has been willing to take the gloves off. Sometimes they're like, okay, we're not going to remove this made in Iran stamp on this missile part, or okay, we're going to actually publicize missile launches from our territory into Syria within three miles of where you guys are. We are going to publicize video of our drone strikes against uh, Kurdish dissidents uh, and insurgents uh, in Iraq, for instance. We're going to publicize all of this. We are going to launch from our territory cruise missiles at the heart of the most by the way, uh, by the, way the Iraq stuff, not to cut you off, but I'm going to cut you off. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, on the Iraq stuff, you know, uh, uh, I'll just interject one thing. You know, one of the things that sticks in my craw, and I got to interject this, is that, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of commentary about the Iraq war and to, the decision 2003 to go to war there. But it really bothers me that a lot of the same people who are sort of apologists for Iran will flog the U.S. for going to war in Iraq in 2003 and not blame the Iranian regime for much of the chaos and instability and violence and death, the high death toll of that war that followed. When it's clearly the Iranians have played a, a massive role in destabilizing that country and in fomenting violence, uh, sectarian violence in Iraq. It bothers me to this day because, you know, I, look, if I go back to March 2003 and could wave a magic wand and stop the invasion, I would do it, uh, you know, because I think the consequences of the uh, Toppling of Saddam sort of outweigh the benefits, obviously. So, but one of the reasons is that, you know, there were policymakers, and Tony Blair talks about this in his memoir, and there were other sort of officials you could see at the time where Iran, you know, what they were being told, decision makers, including Blair and others, were told was that, oh, Iran isn't going to cause problems for us in Iraq. They just want stability. So they're not going to cause any issues post Saddam. They just, they're going to be happy to get rid of Saddam. They want stability in Iraq. That wasn't what they wanted at all. You know, they wanted to, to basically expand their sphere of influence, kick the Americans out and foment violence to accomplish their goals as a revolutionary actor, you know. And the bottom line, when you look at this stuff, you know, I mean, now today when you're talking about Iran, Benham, your career basically started post 
you know, several years post 2003, but you've come into this environment where that hangs over all these discussions, right, about Iran and where Iran's going. Right. I mean, that's, that hangs over everything. So anytime you're talking about what Iran's doing, the first thing you get is, oh, you just want another 2003 Iraq war. Well, no, uh, that's not true. But second of all, actually, why was that Iraq war so problematic, by the way, following the toppling of Saddam? Oh, right. Because of the Iranian regime. Yeah, because of and Al Qaeda, you know, and the two sides fomenting sectarian violence, and you know, and the and 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 sometimes the confluence between the two, you know. So, um, you know, basically, this stuff, you know, a lot of times your your research, which is invaluable, um, and your granular analysis and, and fact based sort of analysis of this stuff, I think people, um, you know, in Washington, unfortunately, a lot of times you don't get to hear that, and that's hopefully we're we're getting into some of that, or we brought a lot of people to that today on the podcast, and we're definitely gonna have you back again. I think we have probably one or two other questions. We'll wrap up this episode. But we're only on the proviso that you come back to talk more about Iran uh, in the future. Bill, do you have anything else yeah. before we uh, close up shop here? I got one more question for him. But I'll let you go first. Yeah, I, I do. And it, it, in Syria. So there's been a lot of targeting of the IRGC and Hezbollah. Um, the Israelis obviously want to keep beating back or preventing the um, the Iranians from establishing a, a, a stronghold in southern Syria. Um, how effective has, have, has the Israelis been? been with their strategy. I mean, I've heard reports of between hundreds and, and thousands of Israeli strikes, uh, largely against weapons depots and weapon shipments. But there's been RGC commanders and Hezbollah leaders and, and operatives that have been killed in these strikes. Is it, you know, do you, do you see this as something that is it part of the price? No, I'm going to get it. I'm going to inject one more thing. Iran isn't just willing to commit the weapons. They're but willing to commit the individuals. For instance, I remember in Iraq, uh, an IRGC a general was killed and the Iraqis put a poster up to him. So the Iranians aren't just sending in weapons and providing training. They're often on the front lines of the fight in it when they're advising as well. And they've been doing this inside of Syria as well. So, but uh, my question to you is, uh, has, have the, has this significantly impacted the RGC? Do you see it as a, as, is it a push in Syria? Is, is Iran had, um, is it a net gain or has it been a, a net loss for Iran inside of Syria? Well, I, I think, you know, looking at this chain of countries and I think chain is an important, uh, important word because back, I think in 2012, uh, Raf Sanjani, he was a former president back in the day from 89 to 97. Uh, he was he was a you know conservative pragmatist, you could say. That means he's still willing to kill you, but dine oil deals with you at the same time. That's what that means usually. Um, he had um, been talking, I think, to an Iraqi official um, about the... Do you guys see me? Hello? Yep, yep we got you. Okay, sorry. Something came in. You're just your video uh, went out. Oh, okay. Raps and Johnny, I think, had been talking to an Iraqi official uh, about the chain from Syria or Lebanon, I forgot what country he cited, uh, back to Iran. Um, and he said, if the chain is cut, bad things will happen. You know, I'm just kind of paraphrasing him, but that's basically what he said. If the chain is cut, bad things will happen. And I think Iran understands that in, in, in many ways, the best defense is offense. And because its footprint is lighter, because it enters the battle space earlier on, because it uses proxies and partners, because it ships weapons and then money and then men, usually in that order, um, it's able to shape the escalation outcomes of certain conflicts. And then it can work with places where it has state allies like Syria, the Assad regime, or work to co-opt or create partners in the state, like in Iraq, like a potential Trojan horse model, um, and altogether look to control these environments. And Iran has really created this land bridge, this kind of alternate supply route. You know, it ships a lot of stuff by air to Syria. And you might say, well, why the hell does it need a, a land route if it has an air route? Well, you know, redundancy is a good thing in military planning, not a bad thing. <laughs> and in many ways, Soleimani was effective in getting the militias that we now know today to be in these key border crossings between Syria and Iraq. And that's why when the U.S. strikes them there, and then perhaps more importantly, when the Israelis strike them, uh, it matters so much. People talk about the Israeli air campaign. The Israelis talk about the war between the wars. That's their framing of it. Um, but people talk about it as kind of a mowing of the grass. To me, that's a good analogy because it, it's more about tactics than strategy. The Israelis are able to offset Iranian advances. They're able to make dents. Uh, but Iran is still interested in Syria. And Iran thus far is still willing to commit men, money, munitions to the Syrian defense, is still willing to go right up to the Golan Heights, uh, has had IRGC officials. I think I wrote about this in LWJ with you folks yes, you five years ago. Uh, people in Gwanaitra, 
be killed by helicopter gunships. I think it was uh, Al-Ladari was the name of the IRGC guy. You guys have written about Taghavi, I think, in Iraq, taken out by ISIS. Um, you know, and everyone knows Amir, a friend of ours, uh, was writing about uh, Hamadani in Syria. And, and Tony, another colleague from the office, talking about uh, the Hezbollah uh, fighting in Syria. Everybody has talked about this from their angle, from the angle that they're studying. Because as different as we are, we can all agree that it's happening, that the Israeli air campaign is happening, but that Iran is still moving stuff. You know, John in the office, he focused on precision guided munitions. Well, these things are still being trafficked through these battle spaces to get to the front lines, to arm these proxies. And while Israel has been able to use the conflict to be able to erode these advances, I don't think it's solved the issue. It's unfortunately become a management thing. But why I think the Israeli campaign is so important, and a footnote to it afterwards, is because it penetrated that same myth. I've talked about this myth of Iranian military invincibility. It penetrated it at the regional level and at the right time. For so long, Iran benefited from the claim, untested, but benefited, that if you attack us kinetically, you launch World War III in the region. The region is going to go to hell. So don't attack us kinetically. Let us make our incremental gains because it's too costly for you to respond with massive escalation against our incremental escalation. So just absorb our escalation. Be good. Be quiet. You don't care about the region anyway. We know you're leaving at one point. And just watch us do this, and we promise we won't be too bad to you, stuff of that nature. Get foreign forces out of the region. That's usually the banner they put this under. And uh, the Israelis have punctured that because they've been able to use the military options selectively against targets uh, in Syria that are uh, Iranian-backed or have Iranian operators there or Iranian weaponry there, uh, and show that it doesn't necessarily need to trigger a region-wide World War III. The Israelis have, I think, been able to bring some of that campaign into Iraq, but really they've kept it relatively isolated to Syria, this key choke point. Uh, they're not solving the problem, but they're managing it. And they're able to show the Iranians when the Iranians try to respond like I did in May 2018 with missiles or stuff from Syrian territory into Israel, that Israel can not only not block it, they'll not only not absorb it, they'll block it but they'll retaliate massively and try to offset that Iranian incremental escalation. And Iran's reputation, the Islamic Republic's reputation takes a hit and their military capabilities take a hit and their planning takes a hit. And then you put this on top of, so puncturing that myth of World War III, then impeding or cutting out their reputation and capabilities. And then you put this on top of if the regime has less money and it keeps privileging these foreign adventures with less money at a time when there's popular pressure at home to stop spending money abroad. Literally, the protests from 2017 to present have been very Iran first, kind of populist nationalist by the kind of pro uh, demography and makeup and slogans we see uh, in these 2017 to present protests. Then the Israelis are helping to keep Iran in that bind because if Iran, for strategic reasons or ideological reasons or even domestic factional reasons, keeps overreaching into the region, into Syria, trying to project power into the Eastern Med, trying to increasingly sharpen the knife they have in Israel's throat by arming and equipping Lebanese Hezbollah. What the Israelis are showing is that the money you spend is going to be wasted. And I don't know when it was exactly, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, an Israeli friend of mine, uh, he's a journalist, he showed me a cartoon in Haaretz, I think it was, and it was Rouhani and some IRGC guy uh, in front of a cargo plane, and there's some uh, boxes, some crates being loaded onto the cargo plane, and uh, Rouhani turns to the IRGC guy and says, isn't it just cheaper if we blow it up here? <laughs> meaning that you know this stuff that we're sending is going to get destroyed and in so many ways that stuff could have was or could have been the sanctions relief that Iran was squandering on these foreign adventures rather than its own people so in many ways i think the fact that you have a regional player being able to step up effectively not solving the problem but managing the problem uh, is going to be is going to have to be the beginning of a more regional containment and perhaps even defanging of the Islamic Republic uh, in the region. And part of the, the flow now we see with the normalization, you know, it was very covert between the Arabs of the Persian Gulf and the Israelis, but now it's become overt through normalization, is that the Arabs have watched for the past decade in real time, the U.S. stock declining about the footprint in the region, the Iranian stock, at least rhetorically, potentially, militarily increasing, and the only other regional source that can push back the Iranians is the Israelis. So it's kind of natural that there's going to be this convergence. So in short, it's a key part of the pushback on Iran. It's not going to solve it, but it is the beginning of a larger conversation about how to do exactly that.
So I was going to ask you about to speculate a little bit or or not even speculate, but give us your assessment of what you think the incoming Biden team is going to do. But instead of doing that, why don't we have you back on the show to talk about the first months of the incoming Biden administration? You know, uh, President elect Biden has his own views on all this. He wants to get back into the Iranian nuclear accord, from, you know, known as JCPOA. That's the acronym given to it. And everybody knows about it in Washington under that acronym. Uh, but instead of speculating on all that, why don't we why don't we talk about the actual facts of what he does or doesn't do in the initial months of his administration in terms of how things are going to change? We'll be back to talk about it. Does that sound good to you, Benham? Sounds great. So we've had this week, we've had uh, Benham Talablu, our colleague. He is a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, as are we. Uh, we appreciate you coming on the show, Benham, and giving us so much of your time to talk about these issues. You, you did a lot of great work and writing and analysis on Iran and its proxies and how it foments terror throughout the region. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Pleasure. Thank you for having me and looking forward to being back. Sorry I talked too long. <laughs> I know no, you guys Benham, have more yeah. no, it's looking forward to having you back. Benham, uh, you, you cut me, you stopped me from talking too long. So that's a, you know, so if anything, you've basically saved listeners from having to listen to, to Tom Jocelyn ramble on and on and on about Various topics. So, you know, hey, you know, I guess we could do we could do a we could do a different episode maybe as we close up, close up the year here, Bill. We got to for our listeners, we are planning on doing airing of grievances, which should be colorful. What do you think? Should we do that? I am looking forward to that. Yeah, we, we could do an airing of grievances, which would be, I think, entertaining. That sort of takes off of the Seinfeld concept of that, where you had the the holiday of Festivus, where, you know, obviously uh, Frank Costanza and his character, they'd have the airing grievances at uh, Benham. You're a big Seinfeld fan, I think, right? So you, a Festivus for the rest of us. Yeah, so we'll, we're going to do that on Generation Jihad. We're going to have a Generation Jihad for the rest of us uh, in airing grievances. Just got to figure and, out how to get the Festivus tree up. I, think that's I don't know, Bill. It's a it's poll. It's, it's a poll. Right. It's a poll, right. It's a poll, right. It's a poll, that it's a mouse shit. That's right. That's right. All I know is I've got a lot of problems with you people. So that's going to be that's going to be a lot. And of fun you're going to hear about it. Yeah, and you're going to hear about it. exactly. So anyway, thank you to our listeners again this week for listening to this week's episode of Generation Jihad, and thanks again to Ben and our colleague at FDD, for coming on. Please do subscribe to the show. As a reminder, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your podcast. And we will see you again next week.